let it work. Let me hear you. No. All right. Now you're in the house, right? I am so glad to be here. And Marty, thank you so much for your introduction. I have no good sense sometimes. You know, I talk about rights. I talk about uh, everybody being equal. I talk about justice, fairness. I don't give a damn where I am. But I'll tell you what, I'm really scared if I don't, because when I go back to Washington and, and Paul Gordon finds out that I didn't talk about LGBT is issues, he then, he's my speech writer, by the way, and uh, he messes all my speeches up once I don't mention LGBT. So uh, I'm really scared of that. So wherever I go, people say, oh, your speech was great. Uh, you know, you, you said all the right things. I wouldn't know what to do without Paul Gordon and the terrific speeches that he writes. He is a great speech writer. But the one thing that Paul Gordon does not do, he does not put words in my mouth that I don't want to say. That's the one thing about Paul, because we sit down, we talk about the issues and where I'm going to speak and, and more or less what I want to say. Uh, the only thing is that he puts them all together so beautifully, and then everybody gives me credit for them. But every once in a while, and if you promise not to tell him, I do sometimes go off script, okay? So if I go off script today, promise me you won't tell him. Uh, I am delighted to be here, uh, sisters and brothers, and uh, I don't think I've ever missed a Pride at Work convention, have I? All right. I'm sorry, that wasn't loud enough. I'm also very proud of a special designation that I've been given. Walter Johnson from San Francisco, the former president or uh, executive secretary of the San Francisco uh, Central Labor Council, and I are both honorary lesbians. Uh, and I, I'm very proud of that title. Thank you. Sisters and brothers, I bring you greetings on behalf of President John Sweeney and Secretary Treasurer Richard Trumka as, uh, oh, big news. President John Sweeney, as of Thursday, is a first-time grandfather. Can you imagine that? He is floating on cloud nine. So, of course, he couldn't be here. Richard, I think, has assignments el elsewhere. But as I always like to fondly say, you've got the best looking of the three officers here today with you. Okay? And on another front, they never send in two men to do a job a woman can do by herself. Whoa! So on that note, if you promise not to tell them what I said, okay? Gets me in a little trouble. But uh, Marty, as I said, thank you for that introduction, and I have been looking forward to being with you. Uh, it's great to see so many of my friends here. I run into you wherever I go. Uh, I don't care where I am. There's always someone who says, I remember you, you went to the Pride at Work convention, or I remember you, you came to speak at our Central Labor Council or our state federation. And Marty is right. When we talk about issues, when we talk about what's right, when we talk about what's fair, when we talk about discrimination or when we talk about how people are struggling every day and, and suffering all kinds of discrimination, why don't people include LGBT is beyond me. Because if there is any group that needs representation in this country, it is the LGBT community. And proudly, I come to you with a message about where I stand and where the AFL-CIO has stood on the issues of your community. But I'll tell you the real reason I'm here, and that is because I want to pay tribute to all of you. You come from every kind of workplace and every part of the union movement, but the wonderful thing that you have in common is that you're committed in your heart to building a better life for LGBT workers. And every day you show the entire union movement what real solidarity is all about. You have a lot to be proud of. There has never been a time, and I mean never, when LGBT workers have needed you more than they do right now. In this room, there's so much talent, so much dedication, so much commitment to the union movement. I thank you for that. Each of you is a precious resource that we need. And I want to urge you to do even more than you're doing already to build Pride at Work even more. 
to recruit more members to make it as strong and vibrant as it can be. Over the last 10 years that I've been in office, going on almost 11, and specifically since the year 2000, I've been working very hard to build the strength of our constituency groups. I cannot be any prouder of the work that Pride at Work has done and the strength that it has brought to its organizations. And I want to thank them very personally for the work that they've done. But you know what? I'm going to thank you even more for the work you're going to do because we're going to really make you work uh, because the constituency groups are important. But Pride at Work sh is a shining star as far as I'm concerned. Lancy asked me to report to you on what's going on in America what we're doing now in the union movement and the direction that we need to go. And she asked me to talk about two issues you're focusing on at this convention, immigration and the war in Iraq. Now, sisters and brothers, I wish I could stand here and tell you that in America, this land we love, this land we built, this land that belongs to us and our loved ones is working the way it should. But the terrible truth is, and both all of us know it, and that it, it isn't working. It isn't working, and we know why. Ever since George W. Bush and his people seized control of the White House five years ago, our most precious values have been trampled. You got that right, you can hiss all you want. <laughs> He's bad. Millions of good middle-class jobs disappear day after day, year after year. And who are the victims? Of course, it's the hardworking women and men who are doing the best they can but their jobs still vanish. In the public sector, it's called contracting out or privatization. In the private sector, it's called outsourcing or downsizing or shipping jobs overseas to nations where working people are exploited and underpaid and have no rights. But wherever you are, when you lose your job, your life is shattered. And our sisters and brothers who have had to go through all of this are not the only victims. The victims also are all the rest of us because the economic security of all of us is threatened. And what's more, those of us who are lucky enough to still have our jobs are caught in a terrible downward job spiral. Every single day, working people are working harder and harder for less and less. And what you see all around you is the same story for others who contribute to our society. The brave women and men who protect us and serve us, the police, the firefighters, the coal miners, soldiers in Iraq, people who drive our buses, people who take care of us when we're sick, people who work in every walk of life are not getting the protection from our government that they need and they deserve. And all of us know how wrong this is. Because of this, because of all the damage that the Bush administration and this Congress has done to our country, there's a ter terrible chance that our young people will be the very first generation in American history who are worse off than their parents. I know that all of us remember how hard our parents worked to make life a little better for each of us and their parents before them and how we as parents or as folks who know children would love to have a better life for our kids and we can't promise them that. Not in this generation, not with this president and not with this Congress. There's no way we can promise that better life. So what do we tell our kids? What is the answer? Because of the damage that the Bush administration has done, and because they're not going to get the kind of chance that we would like for them to have, what do we go tell these kids when they go out into the world? That's not what America should be. This should be a land of opportunity, a land of progress. It used to be that when working people in other countries lost all hope, we still had hope in America. But today, that's not the, the direction that we're going in, and we all know what's gone wrong. A couple of things, for instance. First, big business and the other powerful interests in this country have cut and run from America, that nation that gave them so much wealth. They have abandoned our values. To them, Fairness means nothing. Loyalty means nothing. Responsibility to your community means nothing. Patriotism means nothing. The only thing that counts with them is how much money they can put into their bank account. Shame on them. Shame on them. <laughs> 
So with all the money they're putting into their bank accounts, guess what they're doing? They're laying off loyal employees who have worked for them for 10, 20, or 30 years. They're slashing the health care benefits that their employees badly need. This particular piece hit me close to home. My daughter calls me and she says, Mom, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm having to go to a lesser health care plan so that I can at least bring a decent paycheck home because uh, I have to take a higher deductible because the city can't pay the insurance, or is not going to pay the insurance, and they're shifting it over to us. So my daughter says, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to cost us more money with less benefits. They're breaking the promises of pensions that they have made to their employees. And they're violating the freedom of their workers who choose a voice at work and who want to belong to a union. And that's reason number one that things are breaking down. Reason number two is that the people who run Washington, D.C., George Bush and Dick Cheney and the leaders of Congress, are not listening to working Americans. They're not listening to the people who work paycheck to paycheck, barely living, barely making it, barely able to feed their families. They're just barely making it. Oh, but the rich are living richer, and the poor are getting poorer every day. I remember a day when a woman or a man who voted for somebody and sent them to Washington believed that that person was going to serve us, that they were going to pay attention to what we had to say. All of us know that that is no longer true. You know, oftentimes what really gets me ticked off, I was going to say something else, but <laughs> I've, I, I'm, You know what really pisses me off? <laughs> we elect these son of a bitches, okay? Okay, okay, you, you asked for it, okay? We elect these people, and they tell us they're going to lead, okay? They, they promise us, oh yes, I'm with you on these issues. They sign a piece of paper that says they believe in the same things that we believe in, right? That's what they tell us. And they hoodwink us. We elect them. And then for two years, they sort of forget a little bit about us, right? And maybe they'll give us a vote or two. But then they tell us, you know, I've got to establish a voting record so I can get reelected. And then the next time I get reelected, I'm going to do things, more things for you. So we get fooled again and put them back into office. So they didn't lead the first time around. So maybe the next time around we figure, okay, well, follow us. You know, we'll show you how to get to the point where you are speaking for us. Well, let me say this. I don't give a damn what party they come from. If they can't lead, if they can't follow, then get the hell out of the way. Let's put somebody in there. I'm probably going to get in trouble for that, okay? <laughs> but I'm sick and tired of politicians who lie to your face, who tell you what they think you want to hear and turn around and do something differently. And we have no better model of someone who fooled us, fooled the country in 2000, and fooled us again in 2004. The Bush administration and Congress are leading us in the wrong direction because all they care about is serving the wealthiest families and the biggest corporations. That's who they answer to. These politicians who should be doing the people's business and should be helping to build, build a better life for working families are up for sale to the highest bidder and everyone knows it. So sisters and brothers, what are our solutions? We have to turn our country in a new direction. We need leaders who are on our side for a change, leaders who do the right thing for a change, and there are a lot of things that they should be doing. They should raise the federal minimum wage. My God, 5.15 an hour, no way. 
I am sick and tired of their arguments that if they give somebody a raise in federal minimum wage, small businesses are going to close. Hello? If you give somebody more money, what do you think they're going to do with it? They're going to spend it. They're going to buy more food. They might even be able to afford a new car. They might be able to afford a few more things for their children, more groceries, you know, that kind of stuff. It's going to go right back into the community. And golly, they might even be able to buy the products that are made, those that are still made in this country. You know, where do they get off that raising the federal minimum wage is going to hurt? It only will help. I wish they wouldn't play games with this issue either. I wish they wouldn't poison the legislation for a federal minimum wage with a tax giveaway worth billions of dollars to multi-millionaires. And you know what? The public saw through their little game on that because they lost it, but don't believe that they're not going to try it again. They will try it again. They should pass legislation that guarantees that no one in our land can be discriminated, discriminated against because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. That has to be passed. And when people commit hate crimes against LGBT people, there will be laws to give those criminals the punishment that they deserve. That's the kind of leadership in the Congress that we need. We need to make our social security system stronger. They should require profitable companies like Walmart Boo. to provide health care to their employees instead of passing the cost along to everyone else. That's what they do in every city. Their children, the children of the people who work at Walmart are the ones that are in the public hospitals because their parents can't afford to buy the insurance that Walmart offers them. They should start to put together a national health care plan that gives affordable coverage to all Americans. And for us, they should restore the freedom of working people to join a union when they want to join a union. And they should pass immigration reform that's fair, hu humane, and just. You know, I wish, I wish that the legislation that is in Congress met that standard, but I, it doesn't even come close. There is no way. All it really does is please the corporations. And it pretends that more border protection is going to solve our immigration problems. Where have they been living? Every single one of these trade agreements, NAFTA, CAFTA, the, the DR, uh, one, every single one of these trade agreements that has been passed has been done, has been done on behalf of these big multinational corporations who want to go to those countries and get cheap labor not good jobs, not good jobs with benefits, or even protection for workers who want to join a union. So when those people cannot earn good salaries in their countries, guess where they come? They come to the U.S. to get a little bit better wage and send money back. Do you know that people who live here, the immigrants that are living here, that the industry is $50 billion that they send back to these countries who are betraying them by getting into these damn stupid trade agreements with the United States of America. So they're exploiting us here. They're exploiting us here by taking the jobs from here and they're exploiting the workers in those other countries. And then they wonder why we have an immigration problem. Hello. That is so sad. Some supporters of the immigration legislation say, today we march, tomorrow we vote. But unfortunately, the voting doesn't happen tomorrow or next year or in the next decade. Under this legislation that Congress wants to pass, these folks who would be, quote, given earned legalization can vote in 18 years from today. 
That's the legislation. It takes you 18 years to earn your citizenship if you live that long and if everything goes right. What we need is real immigration reform that offers a fair, clear path to citizenship for all of those undocumented workers and their families who have been working very hard for years, paying their taxes and contributing to their communities. And it should guarantee that all working people have equal rights on the job. Rights, like minimum wage. Freedom from sexual harassment. A safe workplace, regardless of whether they're born here or elsewhere, undocumented or documented. Finally, our leaders should recognize what the war in Iraq is doing to our country and to Iraq. And it should bring our troops home rapidly. Did you see the report today from the Senate committee that's investigating? Saddam has told him he wasn't in cahoots with Al-Qaeda, and they haven't found a damn thing that ties him to it. And yet, in August of this year, President Bush said why Saddam was consulting with Al-Qaeda. Saddam, that's why he's trying to justify the war in Iraq. And we say, stop, send our troops home. It's time that they stop killing our troops in Iraq over a war that we sh never should have been there in the first place. And take those billions of dollars that they're giving Halliburton and all those companies and spend it on American working families here in this country. <laughs> Pride at Work was the first group in the union movement to understand what the war is really all about. And you were the first to come out against it. And I congratulate you for that. But let me be clear about where the AFL-CIO stands on the war. We support the brave women and men in the armed forces who are deployed in Iraq. Most of them are from working families. They are our daughters and sons, our sisters and brothers, our parents in many instances. We don't want them crippled. We don't want them killed. They deserve a commitment from our leaders to bring them home, period. In a democracy, the government should be telling the truth to its citizens, but that's not what has happened here. The Bush administration lied to us before the war began. It's lied to us about the reality on the ground, and it's lied to us about the terrible challenges ahead. It's long past time for the administration to level with us, and it's long past time for Congress to do its job under the Constitution and provide real oversight. That's why we've got to work very hard to make sure that the people we send to Congress actually stand up and fight for America's working families. But all of these changes that I've been talking about, whether it's minimum wage, LGBT rights, social security, health care, freedom to choose a union, immigration reform, and the war, are changes that our leaders refuse to do on their own. That means that we're the ones that are going to have to make it happen. And it's not just going to fall from the skies. For the sake of our loved ones, for the sake of our future, it really is up to us in the union movement. We have to move forward, and you know, we are moving forward on two fronts, on organizing and political action. On the organizing front, there's a huge shift of resources right now to organizing, and a lot of you are doing it within your own unions. On the political action front, we're changing from a get out the vote operation every two years to every day, year round mobilization that connects our big struggles to political action. In other words, when we support candidates, it isn't because they've got a fancy glitzy ad on TV or because they have a handsome or pretty face. It's because they're standing up and supporting the issues that count for us. That's our bottom line. So what should our priority be? Organizing or political action? Both, absolutely, both. We can't do one without the other. No one knows that better than you do, because you're the experts on this. Everyone in this room who's out there organizing and marching and speaking out and mobilizing knows that behind just about everything, we win, everything that we win, both the political action and organizing, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy. 
Now, I know that every tiny bit of progress is hard, but the fact is that if we fight smart, and if we fight hard, and if we fight creatively, and if we fight tough, we can turn our country around starting this year. I also see the newspaper articles that say we have a chance of taking the House of Representatives. One of the guys that rides, writes in the roll call for Capitol Hill says that we have a chance of getting 30 congressional seats. We only need 15 to turn the House of Representatives over to somebody that's going to try to pass the legislation that we need to pass. And if we can't get the legislation passed because the president won't sign it, we at least can have hearings and we at least can have the opportunity to testify where in the past, anytime there's any kind of a hearing, there's limitations and they don't invite us. We're unwanted over at the White House. We're unwanted in, in this Republican Congress. And every morning I have a ritual I go over to John Sweeney's corner office at the eighth floor of the AFL-CIO, and I look across the street, and the White House is there, and I go <laughs> every morning. It's beginning to turn around. More and more Americans are understanding how much damage Bush and his people are doing, and that they understand that he has taken America in the wrong direction. So now, sisters and brothers, our job is to spread the word. Keep the momentum going. Organize and build the structure we need for Election Day. And that's where you come in. That is why it's so vital for you to put your energy and effort into building for what's coming up ahead. It's in your hands. Now, you don't need me to tell you how important all this really is. You know it already. And I want to encourage you to do more because it's the right thing to do. I want you to pitch in with Pride at Work and with your local union, to get involved in neighborhood walks and phone banking, leafleting, voter registration, anything that helps us towards the goal. So you have a beautiful mission, sisters and brothers, and that is to change this country. I urge you to take it, embrace it, make it your own mission in life. If there's one lesson that all of us have learned in the union movement, and we've learned it over and over again, it's that we can't do what we need to do if we're out there alone and divided. The only way we can win and prosper and make our voices heard is when we're unified, when we act as one, when we speak as one, when we mobilize as one, and when we dream as one. Solidarity is our agenda. Solidarity is our song. Together, we can make America into the land that it's supposed to be, a land that we can cherish because whatever our sexual orientation and gender identity are, that they respect who we are and the work that we do. That is a must. Sisters and brothers, time and time again, the life that you lead, I know, is not an easy one because you feel the discrimination very much, sometimes double if you're a person of color, uh, because of the culture oftentimes because of the attitude and the opinions of some who will discriminate against you. They'll find a reason. It doesn't have to be much. People will. People will discriminate if they feel that someone is different. It happened to me. It's happened to you. Whatever stories, and oftentimes I will tell a story uh, about the kind of things that we all experience in life, there's a story for each and every one of you where you have felt that discrimination, where you have felt discouraged, where you have asked yourself, why do I do this? Why do I uh, make myself a glutton for punishment? Why do I keep doing this? Why is it worth it? Why don't I just give it up and you know just go do something else? That happened in my life. That's happened in my life. It's happened in your life. And it's happened so many times when you get discouraged because you don't get the kind of appreciation. You don't get the kind of praise. Well, I'll tell you, for us people in the labor movement, most, if not all of us, will never have a street named after us. <laughs> We're not going to get a monument, a statue. And there won't be buildings named after us. And in all honesty, for the work that you do and the effort that you put into for the LGBT community, there are going to be 
hundreds and thousands of people that will not know who you are and will not be able to point to someone who made things happen on their behalf. And you will do this because you feel it's the right thing to do. You will be discouraged. You will go home, as I oftentimes did, when I was so discouraged, when nobody took me seriously because I was a Latina woman and because I was a woman, period. And sometimes it was my own union brothers. And I would go home. I wouldn't let them see me cry, but I could cry at home. And I sometimes cried at home, and I would say to myself, you know, maybe I should just go get a job in a restaurant washing dishes. It sure as hell it beats the kind of beating up that I get here every day. And I'd wake up the next morning, and I'd say to hell with it. I'm going to go in there and fight again. But every day for a year, it was not easy. And I would get up and say, do I want to do this? And every morning, I would say, they're not going to beat me down. And sisters and brothers, for the last five years, we have been getting beat down. It's time that we stood up, that we fought back. We said, to hell with them. And we're going to work this election and then we're going to get a president in the White House, and that president better listen to what we say and what we want for working families in this country, and it's going to be up to you, it's going to be up to me, it's going to be up to the work that we do between now and November, and more importantly, the work that we do between this November and November of 2008, and I'm going to be asking you to be there. You need to be there, we need to be there. For every one of you, you need to go back home, take the message, get us 10 more people, so that we can get the job done and America will finally be the land that we love and the land that it should be. Thank you so very, very much.